welcome everybody. Uh, appreciate you taking some time and coming here and uh, hopefully learn something. I'm Jim Hall. Uh, work out of Des Moines, Iowa, systems management and balancing. We do both test and balancing and commissioning work in that area. Um, just want to go through really testing HVA water systems with diversity. Um, challenges, how we set some things up, how we do it, um, and that type of thing. One thing I like to do is um, wide open questions. Anytime you have a question, just raise your hand, holler. Uh, remind me to repeat the question so everybody can hear it if you don't have a microphone. Um, comments, whatever. If you disagree, hey, I have no problem with it. Open it up for discussion. So um, we'll get going here. Basically, as far as learning objectives, uh, we want to understand what constitutes diversity in an HVAC system. We want to learn how to calculate diversity and how it's calculated or if it's calculated. Um, know the difference between pressure independent and pressure dependent. Um, probably use air as our example to compare back and forth between the two of air and water and do we really have a pressure independent water system. So first thing is just get our definition squared away. Um, Diversity, pump size for 300 seat GPM, connected loads 450. Uh, basically, it's the difference in the pump capacity versus the connected load. So we're looking in a, in a situation like this where our load's connected at 450, pump size for 300, we're looking at 33% diversity in the system. Um, anybody tell me how is diversity calculated by the design professional? <laughs> it's not calculated basically. Uh, you have a block load that they'll calculate for their building and that block load is going to tell them they need X BTUs of heating for that building. Then they'll do their individual load calcs for the individual rooms. Um, they can be affected also by coil selections from the manufacturer. The manufacturer might end up saying, hey, it's more cost effective for me to provide a 5 GPM coil in this reheat in lieu of a 3 GPM. Uh, so you run into some little different tad, uh, caveats there with it, but then once you start adding up all your individual loads, that's where you end up coming up with the 450 versus the 300 block load connection. So basically the building, they're saying that building will only need 300 GPM at its peak load. And that's where the challenge starts coming in and saying how are we going to get that 300 GPM proportioned out to all those 450 GPM of devices. So uh, you will find, you know, you can ask the engineer when you're talking to him and going through a job and saying, hey, how should we look at this? What are we looking at? What are you thinking for your diversity number? And start looking at the different numbers. They're going to look and say, well, a lot of them might even not, not realize what you're talking about until you start saying, well, you got 450 connected to 300. And then they're going to think they made a, younger guys will start thinking they made a design mistake or something like that. So. Pressure dependent devices versus pressure independent devices. That's probably one of the biggest things we're seeing a big challenge with right now in our industry. Understanding that a pressure dependent device, if the pressure changes on the inlet of that water valve or that VAV box uh, that is pressure dependent, the flow will change accordingly with it. So pressure goes up, flow's going up, pressure goes down, flow goes down. To make it pressure independent, you're going to start looking at your control scenarios and say it's pressure independent because I don't care what that inlet pressure is to my control valve. I don't care what that inlet pressure is to my VAV box. All I care is the fact that that box or that valve is going to respond to the situation and provide me the design flow or the calculated flow that's supposed to be coming out at that time. So that's the big caveat of trying to understand a pressure dependent versus pressure independent. Uh, probably what, 99% of air VAV systems now are pressure independent where your VAV box airflow does not change as that inlet pressure changes. You got your box dampers changing as they change, your VFDs control to a static pressure and it's burying that amount of airflow for total airflow to your system as your demands required off your static pressure. But as one box changes downstream, other boxes in the system Aren't, the airflow is not changing, okay? So that is the big difference of understanding pressure independent versus pressure dependent. Your load's changing, but your one box is not changing. And then keeping in mind, what's that VAV controlling to? 
and that becomes the other thought process. It's controlling to an airflow set point. And it's also reporting an airflow set point back to the system. So that's where you can start to understand that you have pressure dependent versus pressure independent. Um, a pumping system, that's where we start looking at it. And we can look and say it's a heat pump loop system, chill water system, hot water reheat system. Uh, you can get to a situation where that control valve is opening and closing and you have multiple control valves opening and closing on your system. Your pump speed might be changing to help satisfy that demand or as the demand decreases, start backing the pump off. But you can get to a situation where that control valve is not seeing design water flow. If it's 100% open and it's sitting far away from that uh, differential pressure sensor, the pumps and other ones open up further downstream, the pump starts going up, you might not see that water flow out of that farther device that's opened up asking for water flow. Um, so that's where you start looking and say, do I really have a pressure independent system just because my pump is controlling to a, a differential pressure set point? You got to look at your load and say, what's happening at my load? And how are my controls controlling that valve to make it pressure independent? VAV box is controlling to an airflow set point. Control valves in most situations, typically not, are not controlling to a water flow. Typically, they're controlling to what? Discharge air temperature or room space temperature, and that's how they're not controlling to that water flow. That's what I was just saying right there. Depending on where your device is, where your DP sensor is, the control speed, the, the PID loop of that VFD, uh, how fast that pump's responding, how fast the control valve's responding, you can see a change in water flow at that control valve as the system's changing and it's dynamic. So as things are opening and closing, pumps going up, going down, you're not guaranteed to get water flow or design water flow with that valve. Does that make sense? Anybody disagree with that? I like that. The one little nice caveat to that now is pressure independent control valves. Um, I think every week it changes because you now do have pressure independent control valves that do report water flow. And they are starting to look at that and say, it's really not a pressure independent control valve in the terms of we think a pressure independent system. The pressure independent control valve maintains a constant differential pressure across the control valve. And at that constant differential pressure, at a given control valve position, you have the water flow. So if you've worked with them before, you'll always see that they've got a 45 degree open. And at this DP, if we're maintaining 5 to 20 PSI or 30 PSI across that device, and at this control valve position, we know we're getting design water flow. Okay? Now, in that scenario, what does your system know that it's doing? It's controlling to a DP set point. Your valve's still probably controlling to discharge air or room temperature. So your water flow still is not known at that valve because that control valve position might be 100% open or it might be 20% open. So we're still not controlling to a flow, it's just pressure independent to maintain that flow at that control valve set point. Now that said, God, probably in the last six months, uh, you've probably seen some of the different manufacturers out there publicizing all the different ways now that they're starting to do it. You're starting to see them tag an ultrasonic flow meter on the inlet of that uh, control valve to give you water flow, to now start controlling to a water flow amount. Okay, so now you're going to sit there and say, if that's what we're going to do, your control strategies are probably going to change a little different, and now you can start thinking of it maybe more as a pressure-independent system like you do a VAV system. So all I can say on pressure-independent control valves, a couple caveats. Make sure you understand what you're getting or you're working on. Um, you'll find out a lot of the salesmen out there, I used to be one, so they love selling new product and they love getting it out there, but a lot of times they don't understand how it works within the system. And you're going to find out a lot of times they're putting a pressure independent control valve in a system that might not need it. Biggest hiccup we found is they require more pumping energy. They have a large pressure drop across them. 
And that large pressure drop can create a lot of problems in your system. Um, we've had several systems where we've actually had them take them out and put in a normal control valve so we can get design water flow at the coil. So they're working on that side of it, I hear, but uh, right now there's one of their biggest downfalls. Uh, keep in mind, they're not a balancing valve. There's no settings on there for us to go through as a, as a tab company and say, we're gonna set it to this and get water flow. Most of them do not have ports that allow for water flow measurement even. They're giving you ports just to tell you that you're in an operating range and in that operating range of that control valve position, you have designed water flow, okay? So be careful on pressure independent control valves. There are good applications for them. And that's what it's a matter of uh, that engineer sitting down with that salesman going through and making sure it is a good application. So let's look at a building. Uh, typical high rise, high rise for us, Des Moines, Iowa, okay? So nine floors. In this scenario, we're gonna say we've got 450 GPM, 300 GPM a pump. So same example of what we were just talking about, 33% diversity. We look at that and we say, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna balance it, okay? If I only have three GPM a pump, how am I gonna approach getting design water flow at every element? So we're gonna go through and sit there and say, one, can diversity be sim simulated? Uh, trying to simulate diversity becomes a challenge. And when you start doing that, what are you gonna do when you're setting up your different um, valves for different scenarios. So if you set it up and you say, I'm gonna blow open 50% of the valves to 100% and simulate this and simulate a west exposure and do that, once you set those valves, you're setting that one condition. You cannot redo it now. Or you can redo it, change your valve positions. Now you can find you might be short in some areas, overflowing in other areas. So um, the other thing that always comes in is project scheduling. Um, that always becomes a challenge of they want you in, they want you out, and if we can give you part of a system, can you start balancing that system partially and start working on that system now, work your way through the building. So scheduling could dictate how it's approached and how you look at that building, how you're gonna do it if you have diversity in your water system. So our, we, we step back and we try to say, okay, hey, what can we do since we cannot really go through and set every valve for design water flow? What are our goals? We want to make sure everything can get water flow in a, quote, worst case condition as far as we can see. We want to establish a differential pressure set point if the pumps are controlling to a DP sensor. We want to make sure we get a differential pressure set point set. Uh, we want to test the pump and make sure it can deliver design flow, um, typically at 100% open condition, make sure it doesn't overload. Um, and then the big thing, set it up to operate as efficiently as possible. We want to try to limit the amount of restriction we put on the total system. Uh, the more we start closing valves, the more restriction we put on the system, the higher the pressure, the harder the pump has to run. So the more we can leave open, the better off we are. Uh, recently, uh, you might have just seen an article in ASHRAE. Stephen Taylor put it out there, uh, December 2017, doubling down on not balancing variable flow hydronic systems. Um, in essence, if you read the article, he's got a bunch of great caveats. And the one thing that I love that the first clarification, to be clear, this discussion relates to hydronic distribution systems with modulating two-way valves on or at most coils controlled by closed control loops to maintain space temperature or discharge air temperature. So he starts getting all his caveats in, then he starts going through and saying where it's not good to do it, okay? Um, understanding those caveats, he goes back in further and he says, the key thing, the system can only be manually balanced for one flow condition, and that's what we were just saying. If you set it up and you open that whole thing up and it has diversity, what condition are you gonna balance it? And that's where he says it's not even clear how to balance uh, a system with diversity. How are you gonna do it? So a lot of good things and takeaways from that article, I just like how he goes out with the double down and. Uh, that side from some articles he previously produced. It definitely gets your attention. So, um, and that side, but I, you know, it's kind of funny as balancers look at it. Um, if we didn't have to touch water, I think 99% of us would be happy. 20% um, of the business roughly is water for us. 90 plus percent of the headaches is water. So if we got to a situation where we don't have to touch water, I think most, most guys would say, hey, I love this. I don't have a water job. So. Um, but it's interesting, uh, 
Stephen Taylor putting this out there, he got a lot of conversation, and uh, some of you might know I've written a few articles on this myself, so I, I had my inbox flooded from people of, hey, did you see this? You don't have to balance now, and that type of thing. So it was great to have uh, and get some people thinking about it, and if you read through the article, you've got to pull out the caveats from it. Um, a lot of it parallels some of the things we're saying here. Um, following, we're going to go through a couple examples, try to get you guys thinking and go through it. Uh, the examples are not necessarily ways to approach and balance a system. Uh, they have been ways that we've been asked to go do something and look at it and try to do it. So keep that in mind as you think through it. But the main thing is I just want you guys to go through a thought process and say, if I have that scenario and I have a 450 GPM connected load and I have a 300 GPM pump, what can I do? What am I going to do? How is it going to be set up? Um, typically, a lot of times, we'll just hear open the whole thing up and proportion the water flow and start going and then let's see what we get. So typically you open up a, a system 100%, um, you got a 300 GPM pump, on 450 GPM, you might get 330 out of the pump just because you have less resistance and you have more connected load available. So the big thing we're going to look at and we're going to say is when you're sitting in that scenario, we might say the pump can get 330, you start balancing, we work from the pump out. We'll start getting our design water flow. Well, the next thing you know, we get up to the top eighth and ninth floor, we have no water flow. So at that point, everybody's starting to think, well, hold on, we can't do it that way, all right? And it's always funny, the next comment that typically comes is balance it to diversity. That'll work even better. So balance it to diversity, I had to have an engineer explain to me what he really was looking at. And when he said, let's balance it to diversity, he was basically saying, set all your valves to the percent diversity of water flow for the system. So, because he looked at that other example, we're laying it out on the job for him and going through, and he says, well, shoot, if I just cut them all back, now I can get water flow to all my valves. And we're like, okay. So he said, if I have 50 GPM at that floor, let's set it for 33. And we started going through looking at doing that and going through and setting it up. And basically, you end up with a scenario of a lot of caveats. Pretty much, you end up with a lot of resistance on the system. And then you get to a situation where a control valve got 100% open. And guess what? You can't get design flow. You're not, you're not getting your heating or your heat pump loops not getting a compressor turning on because you've got that balancing valve closed too far. And then you also found out that um, that pump wasn't even going to deliver 300 GPM because we put so much resistance on that system it was, it was having trouble getting 300 GPM. So um, definitely, when you hear somebody say, and it became a, I haven't heard it as much lately, but maybe a couple years ago, a lot of people will just balance it to the diversity number. And I think a lot of it times, it was their way of saying, I'm not sure what to go with, but that at least I can get water flow everywhere. So, um, but have those conversations with them when they start talking about that. Um, Probably the biggest thing we look at and we say that we end up going through is saying, let's test it under control. And when we say test it under control, that's where a lot of options come available. Um, and I'm not going to say one's going to be better than the other. I'd love to be able to say, okay, guys, here's, here's how we're going to do it, and this is going to apply to every job, but that's unfortunately not the case. Uh, you can have a system that is... Uh, a heat pump loop system, you might have to look at differently than a reheat water system, different than a chill water system, some scenarios like that. It might be the layout, uh, or once again, it might be the schedule that dictates how you're going to look at that system and how we're going to balance it. So, um, you know, we can look and say we're going to open a floor at a time. Typically, that works well on scheduling. Proportion out that floor and make sure we have water flow on that floor. Um, we can balance it under control and try to set every valve to design water flow. But once again, that, we're almost back to the point of trying to simulate diversity and what's that going to get us. It might work on a building that doesn't have a lot of um, square footage or a lot, of, a, a lot of coils. But then again, you can go back and retest and see where your different options are. So you get a lot of coils, a lot of, a lot of square footage you really have to start stepping back and even looking at it further and figure out where your water is going to be and that type of thing. Um, the one that we lean towards quite a bit, and it's ironically the one that when you get down to the nuts and bolts of Stephen Taylor's article, 
is really testing it for functionality. And when you look at that, you say for a reheat system, maybe we'll index all the coils into heating mode and then make sure and get a discharge air temp, entering air temp, water temp, and start looking and saying, are we getting heating at all our reheat coils? Or are we getting, you know, are all our compressors kicking on and, and are we satisfying our heat pump loop? And looking at that as we're setting our DP sensor. Now, when you do that, you're going to have to start looking and saying, I'll probably need to take some water flow measurements at different areas throughout the building, see where my water is, see where my pressures are, and then also find out and say, you know what, I got a ton of water going to the east wing. I need to start cutting back a little on the east wing, get some more to the west wing. And you're going to have to start looking at some different scenarios in that type. Uh, like I said, I'd love to be able to say, hey, here's a, here's a standard protocol. Item one, do this. Item two, do this. But when you're starting to talk diversity in the system, you don't have a standard protocol. And a lot of times it's going to be sitting down with the design professional saying, okay, one, what was your design intent? Two, what's your sequence of operation? And three, what do you expect us to do? And uh, usually when you give them the what do you expect us to do, you're going to get that answer back that says, I don't know, what do you think I should do? And when you get that, open the conversation, get going, and you have to start looking and saying, what do we have? Question? So when we start looking at it, we, like I said, we think of that thought process. You know, do we have diversity? And if we do, let's start looking and start thinking how we're going to approach the whole job. You know, first thing we always want to do is test that pump for performance, make sure it can meet design conditions. Typically, we'll go ahead and open the whole system 100%. Test it, make sure it doesn't overload, and just see what the pump does with all control valves 100% open. Um, and then as we're working through the system, and if you're doing a temperature test, you're doing some spot checks, big thing is look at your differential operating, uh, differential pressure operating set point. See where it is, see what it's going, make sure you're getting water flow to your worst case coils. A lot of times by just looking at those drawings, Seeing where you are, seeing where your largest load is, typically the engineer has is the farthest point in the system, as we know. So how can we get water flow out to that coil? And it's, if so, how can I do it with the lowest operating set point possible? Um, you know, one thing I always try to look at, and we say we can't simulate diversity, but try to avoid testing the system with little or no demand. So if you're out there working and it's a reheat system or a heating system, you're working in the summertime, and you don't have a big demand, you might want to go ahead and open up some floors and see what happens and start moving some water around in the system to see where the water's going. Where am I having trouble getting water in that type of scenario? Um, and the big thing I always say is operate, have it set up to operate as efficiently as possible, which goes back to trying to leave valves open all the time. And the more balancing valves you can leave open to let the control valve do its work, the better off you are as far as system resistance. So, uh, making sure that control valve is sized properly and the balancing valve is sized properly, let the control valve do its work. That's a big, big thing that helps out quite a bit. Um, that is really what Stephen Taylor says in his article when you start looking at that whole thing and, and try to take the caveats out of it and work through it. It's, he's not saying don't balance it to a point. Really, you're going to test it, and that's almost what we get back to saying. We're not going to balance and proportionally balance that system with diversity, but we're going to test it. And we're going to test it to make sure that it's functioning to the design intent of what the designer wants. And that's where it gets a little creative, a little more art than science. Yes? Correct. So what I was saying, as we looked at earlier, when you open that system 100%, you have a 300 GPM pump, you have less resistance with 450 connected, you're going to get 330 or 350 GPM. So he's asking, do we throttle that pump back to 300 and then start working from there? No. We, remember, that pump's operating on a differential pressure control. So leave it at that 350. You know that pump can do 350 wide open, hopefully not overload. And then at that point, you can start proportionally balancing and then watch what your DP set point is and keep that down and let the VFD control the, the pump down. If you close that discharge valve on the pump and throttle it down to 300, 
you're now added more head. Now the pump's got to work harder to get to that 300. And when your control valves start going under control, now you got more head, so you might not get design flow. So let the, let the VFD do the control. Let it back down. So. so one thing we look at and try to do is when we get that system, we start looking at, we've got a form that we just use that basically says what kind of system is it, condenser water, chill water, heat pump loop, reheat water. Start going through and say, what's my connected load? Uh, we might break it out per floor. We might break it out per wing or building if it's a multiple building application. Um, what does a pump do? And then start figuring out diversity and how we want to look at that. Ideally, we love to do this ahead of time before the drawings are even issued for bid. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. Um, if it can happen, it allows us to do a lot of different things looking at a system. And then that's one thing we'll look at here and the different things you can look at. So as we say, things to think about when you're looking at that system, when you're looking at going through it. Um, one of the fun things is we always get hung up on reheats and small water flows. Um, you start talking about one, two, three GPM or a half a GPM or less than one GPM. Um, that's not a lot of water flow. Accuracy becomes questionable to a point, let alone trying to throttle a valve down to get that water flow is very difficult. Um, funny thing to do, and, and we'll do it, is you'll take a five gallon bucket and take two five gallon buckets, fill one of them up half full, and tell that engineer to dump a half a GPM and regulate that into the other five gallon bucket. Uh, it never can be done. It's amazing that they all of a sudden see how little of water flow that is and how much you're trying to regulate. And you start thinking, saying, hey, does that really matter if I have one GPM of overflow on a half a GPM? Maybe, maybe not. If you start thinking we do have an overflow issue, then maybe you should be looking at using automatic flow limiting devices and then prevent an overflow issue in that scenario. Because uh, the one thing you always, the ASHRAE had a study back, 90% of heat transfers obtained at 50% of water flow at the 180 degree water temp. So you still get your BTUs, even though your flow is down on that side at 90%. So um, thinking of that, looking at it, say, what, you know, trying to get to those numbers, you know, chill water, different story. You really need to look and make sure you got your good water flow there and you've got your water flow to make sure you get your uh, coil temperature and that type of thing. Reheat, more forgiving. So chill water, not as forgiving. Um, Start looking at that, start looking. Like I said, if you have excess flow, look at automatic flow limiting devices. Um, you notice how the industry over the past five years changed the name from automatic balancing valves to automatic flow limiting devices because they don't automatically balance. We were kind of hoping they did, but they didn't. Um, they limit flow. That's the main gist of that automatic flow limiting device. So um, prevents overflow in situations that can create your delta T problems and that kind of thing. So you might have a great application where you can use those and they'll help out and they'll be an efficient solution for that side. Um, always think about what's the control valve controlling to. Is it controlling to temperature or is it controlling to flow? You might have a special process set up or some type of system where you're actually seeing flow or measuring flow. And in those situations, you might have to look and say, how are we going to set this up then in that scenario? if we do have a process system or we have a chill water system where they're actually measuring flow uh, to get that set up correctly. You know, what are the schedule and phasing challenges? What do you have there? Um, that always seems to dictate not only water side but air side balancing and dictates the commissioning process. You know, uh, I would say probably one of the best things about the commissioning process that's come about in our industry is forcing the owners now to think of a schedule beforehand and now they're doing their, oh, poll schedules, working from move-in date, how much commissioning time, balance time, working back. And now we're starting to see some time to get the work done and be able to do it correctly. So that's been one great benefit that we've seen in that side. Um, measurement limitations, think of that. If you have flat pump curves, strainer effect, um, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with that. Uh, basically, you can get to a point on a balancing valve that if you close it too far, that opening becomes smaller than a 10 mesh strainer, and that then becomes your strainer and starts plugging up. So uh, you have to be careful to make sure balancing valves are sized properly, and if you do close them down too far, it, normally 40-50%, once you exceed that 40-50%, um, you start seeing that problem a little more. So um, a lot of times you'd be working on a system and you're having flow issues and some 
things aren't making sense, the system's been up and running for a few months, uh, if you start seeing a lot of your balancing valves are closed down to that level, you can just walk up, open it, and reset it. You'll hear the water flush through. So, um, Utilize discharge air temperature sensors. The, on your VAV boxes, those type of things, it gives you a great gauge of what's going on because your main goal is what? To maintain a discharge air temp or a room temp. So you can trend those, see what's going on with your system. After you've got it set up and you think you're in a good set point or a good position of where you got that water pushed, um, utilize that, trend them on the DDC system. Get an idea of what's heating, what's not heating, where you have problems. It gives you a great idea of what's going on. You trend that with the control valve position, you got a really, really good idea of what your system's doing along with your DP set point and your VFD speed. So the big thing I had mentioned earlier, if you can get involved early and you can sit down and start looking and saying, hey, I can get some branch balancing val valves put in certain places, uh, whether it's off to each floor or off to each building or off to uh, a wing or something like that. In a lot of scenarios, a lot of times you can work with that branch balancing valve Set that for a total flow out to that wing and know what you've got, and then that way you might not have to proportion as much throughout the rest of the wing, but you can proportion your major branches. And the closer you are to the pump with your valve, the easier it is to proportion flow. So if you're on your mains and off your mains, you can proportion that flow a lot easier than trying to do it with your little smaller devices out at each element. So if you get involved early and start doing that, that helps a lot. Uh, like I mentioned, automatic flow limiting devices work out really well in a lot of systems with diversity. Um, biggest, I, I'd say, downfall I hear about automatic flow limiting devices is flexibility. Once you put it in, your cartridge is in there and it's set for 20 GPM, you're limiting down to 20. You can get less than 20 uh, if you underflow it, which is fine. Um, but if you want to get more than 20, you're going to have to change cartridge out or possibly change the valve out. So that's usually the biggest hiccup, because keep in mind, if you have a balancing valve set for 20 GPM, a manual valve, and you don't have enough flow going to that, it's underflowed. All, it, underflowed? It doesn't have as much flow either. So, um, yes? Do you have any concerns with the auto flow limiting devices biting a control valve? Yes. So the question was, do you have, do you have a problem with auto, auto flows fighting a control valve? Um, it goes back to the sizing and getting the control valve sized correctly. And then what ends up happening, so you probably get a control valve hunting some, and then you get a chatter sometimes. Um, the pressure is too high leaving that automatic flow limiting device. So ironically, to get rid of the problem, if you just throttle down the uh, isolation valve in front of it, decrease the pressure, it's usually the ones closer to the pump or right off the main. That's where you usually see that problem. Um, some of the AFLDs have a valve in front of them and that side, and if you throttle that down, you'd bring that pressure down. Basically, it's got too high a pressure going into the control valve is what the problem is, and it starts hunting the control valve and you get a chatter. Um, so if you start hearing a loud chatter noise, you got control valves, it's really not that spring chattering like a lot of people think. It's that control valve and the water pulsing between the automatic flow limiting device and the control valve, so yes. You have to be very careful with that, and you have to look and say, what is my anticipated pressure there? So which auto flow selection should I have? Should I have a 5 to 60 or a 2 to 32? Um, and then even still, you might have that issue come up. So great question. What? Right on the bottom, make sure your control valves are sized properly. Um, like I said, be cautious of pick Vs and that side. A lot, the biggest thing is the amount of energy required to satisfy a pick V becomes a big problem. Uh, make sure balancing valves are sized properly, sized for flow. I think you'll look now, most of the manufacturers now will give you multiple options for a half inch or a three quarter inch or a one inch valve. They don't just send a one inch valve out. It's got a different orifice in it um, that allows you to size it correctly for that flow. The biggest problem you have is, is the contractor thinking he's got a 55 half inch valves and he just puts them wherever he doesn't look to see what it's tagged for. So. Um, they're doing much better with that. Uh, keep an eye out for new technology. Uh, I don't know how many, has anybody seen the differential pressure controllers that people are starting to use now? They're using those on branch piping. Um, a lot of times they'll take that differential pressure controller and they're controlling that branch and, and basically controlling a valve to a differential pressure 
for that wing or for that major branch or for that floor, um, which challenge to set up a little bit, um, as long as they can get their pressure, uh, they seem to be working pretty well. In fact, we have a building that a bunch were just put in, and once the whole building's finished out, they're gonna let us go back through and run some scenarios on it this summer and see how they respond and that type of thing. But um, look at those options. There's some great options coming out there that are available. Like I said, they're look, more people now are looking at flow um, measurement and trying to do some things with flow measurement. Uh, the one thing I'll say, don't get hung up too much in trying to get all this built into a system when how many people have had callbacks on reheat systems because they're not working, they're not heating? You know, they're minimal. They're very forgiving. So if you're going to take the owner's money and start spending it on trying to measure flow to every reheat coil, I, I don't know if that's a wise decision for the owner to say, hey, yeah, this is going to be great. We're going to know flow going to every coil. Do you really need that? Certain situations you might, but don't get hung up and let that engineer start driving down that path of all this technology to take a simple system and make it more complex when it doesn't need to be. So, um, you know, reverse return still does great. <laughs> Tried and true, you first thing value engineered out of every job, you know. But if you look at, go, I'd rather go reverse return than a bunch of pressure independent control valves or a bunch of flow technology valves that are trying to give me flow back on a reheat system. Uh, I would venture a guess that a reverse return system would be less expensive to do and a heck of a lot more efficient too. So don't ever, don't ever shy away from a reverse return system. We have, there's a lot of customers I laugh who have it specified as their standard for all their buildings, but it's always a first thing value engineered out um, in that side. So. Um, no one understand the system design, including the sequence of operation. That sequence of operation can also help dictate how you're going to look at that system, how you're going to set it up, what are you going to do, uh, and that type of thing. And then also, it also gets that control guy involved so you can work with him to start talking about what, what it's going to do, how it's going to work, and then looking and saying, hey, do I have a situation where I'm going to have a big block load condition in this building or not? Or is it going to be standard comfort cooling? Um, you know, is it a lab application that I'm going to have be shooting this water off and I, they need processed water uh, for a certain application or, or it's going off to some heat exchangers to do some extra heating for some other application in the building. So make sure you understand that whole system and work with the design professional and the controls guy to get that worked out. Um, you know, employ common sense. Step back, look and say, what am I really doing? What's our, what's our end goal? And the end goal is to make the system work as efficiently as possible. Yes? Okay. Everybody hear that on differential pressure controllers? Um, they're having great luck with them, but if you drain the system down and maintain the system or you got, and you fill it back up, make sure you get rid of your air. Does the DP set point stay the same? Because since, since, since it's a DP, it's not a single point, right? You're not, you're not resetting your DP. So, so the DP stays the same on that side, so yeah, okay, great. There is, I don't think I've got it in this presentation. The old presentation, there's about a one page. In fact, the uh, Tab Journal just reprinted an article on engineered system. So maybe December, January. And in that, there's about a one page, one and a half page, just sort of standard procedure of <coughs> how to approach that system if it has diversity. Um, and then the nice part about doing that, if you, if you sit down with your design professional, it gets them going through that, they start thinking about it, and then they start also thinking every job at that point and saying, hey, let's put some branch valves in or this or that. And you can actually almost get to a point where you can customize it per job with them. So, and I've always found the more I spend time in the engineer's office, the better off we have percentage of getting the job, so. Yes? 
Yes. Right. So, right. So, great comment about using the uh, that procedure in your testing and balancing plan, and where does that fit in the project? Uh, I like it to fit in early on a design phase of going through it. However, once we get a contract, typically, I don't. Everybody pretty much submits a submittal for their agency on the job, and in that submittal should be the testing and balancing plan that lists how are you going to approach that system. So I think it's a specification step and then yep. start tracking it from there. Yeah. You know, everybody, everybody loves that government work and the government spec. You have to submit each system and each procedure for every system, whether it's a constant volume exhaust fan to a heating water system or whatever. You've got to have your procedure in there and have that testing and balancing plan with it. So, yes. Yes. Right. How do you want to handle it? Right. Right. Why you have it? How do you want to address it? How do you want to set your system up? So no. Yeah, early on is, is fantastic. The, the earlier you can do it, the better off it is in that scenario. So, um, Summary, testing is the key, just like we just heard. It becomes more of an art than a science of looking how we're going to approach it, how we're going to look at that system, how we can get water flow where it needs to be, and then how we're going to document it. And that's probably one of the biggest things is to say, you might have a page and it might be that testing and balancing plan you submitted and said, here's how we set the system up at time of test. Here's how we went through it. Here's what we did. You might end up having more documentation on various components that you tested, what you had open, what you didn't have open, that type of thing, instead of every balancing valve measured. And ironically, you might end up spending more time going through doing that than going valve to valve to valve to valve to valve. Easiest thing to do is go valve to valve to valve. It's like I can tell an engineer, we can get and design water flow at every one of those valves if we wanted. It's just a matter of what am I going to open and close to get design water flow there. But did I do the right thing to get that design water flow there? So documentation of how you tested it and how you set it up is a real big key so they can understand it. And then also, if you start having a heating problem or you have some heat pumps not kicking on or whatever the system's not functioning 100% correctly, you can look and say, okay, I set it up this way. Here's the data I got now. Why am I not getting it here? You might, it might be an easier way to get to uh, a resolution and say, oh, this makes sense. I had all this closed over here and did this and did that. Therefore, I, I gave myself a false sense of security how much flow I could get here. So uh, that documentation of how you set the system up, how you tested it becomes a big, big key. Um, limit the amount of resistance. One thing that we always laugh is, you know, anytime something's written down in a test and balance report or a commissioning report, that's gospel, right? Can't be changed. It's, it's, it's perfect. So we get that and we set that DP set point. And we'll tell all our owners or the facilities guy, all right, we're starting off at 12 PSI. This winter, drop it down to one and trend your VFD speed, your DP set point, make sure it's maintained, your space temperatures, and then you know, see if you get complaints, you know. And the one guy, I laugh, he kept dropping his. He said, so what are you training? He said, ah, I forgot to set that up, but I don't get any complaints. So I just keep going until I got no complaints. You know, and he, you know, it was interesting because then we, once he got to that point, we went back and checked what we used and what we thought set that DP set point. Turned out we were probably 85% of flow, but it was still enough flow to maintain that space condition. So don't be afraid when you get that DP set point set to work with that owner and keep that going through their, winter, their summer period, their winter period, and say, hey, you can reset this because you can end up saving them quite a bit of money as their pump can operate at a lower and lower speed. So just because we came up and said 12 PSI is a set point, 
and then make sure he documents. A lot of times it's great in the DDC systems now that he can document with a note right on that set point and said, lowered this date per so-and-so. And that way you know somebody just didn't lower it arbitrarily and wonder why the system's not working um, or something like that. But have them just note it right in their DDC system and that way they can keep track of what's going on. Uh, preferably run the trends because you can see what's going on with your building at that point. Any other questions, comments, concerns? No, uh, other than what we've put out there in our marketing area, uh, not a lot have come out in that side. Uh, we get a lot of feedback on the, per, on the 5% um, in that side because a lot of times you're in an instrumentation situation, it can't even read within 5%. Um, and trying to get that education out there and say, okay, what does 5%? Goes back, you know, if you're looking at small devices and you're looking at one, two, three, or four GPM and 5% of that, you know, does that really make sense? Because you can't even measure that 5%. So, but no, unfortunately not. Um, a lot of design professionals are afraid to adopt something that is not concrete, that they cannot go back on and say, well, you didn't do this um, in that side. So that's where we've gotten a little pushback, but in the long run, a lot of it's been, well, the goal is to make it work and work efficiently. Um, not to try to get out of work, which always seems to be the misnomer a lot of times. You're trying to do the right thing, and a lot of times they're thinking you're trying to get out of work. And I said, you know what? We can end up more time testing this way than just going to every valve and getting a number. And, you know, I'm sitting in your office talking to you about it because the easier thing to me would been go and I'll get a number on every valve and give that to you. Yes, Chuck? Peter Bill becomes Except difficult. Working with commission gauges to have it happen again. Right. And then when you said documentation, if you got diversity, you got to document so you can repeat all that second time around with everybody there looking. Right. Keep in mind too on your uh, just a second on, on your on your um, instrument calibration, your instrument accuracy. Uh, you got to read those correctly. Um, plus or minus 3%, plus or minus 7 GPM. So really, that's plus or minus 10%. So it, air side, same way. It's plus or minus on, on all your air side equipment. Typically, on your, uh, using, when you use an electronic manometer, it's plus or minus 3%, plus or minus 7 CFM. So at 100 CFM, that's plus or minus 10%. So it, that's what's funny. You start looking at the instrument accuracies and you start looking at what they have. A lot of times you're not as tight as what they think in that side. So, yes. Yes, Don? Yeah, Jim. Okay. Uh, do you prefer closing off a third of the system and balancing as opposed to, uh, or balancing everything at, you know, 63%, you know? I, 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 we shy away from closing off part of a system because once you do that, and let's say you closed off first floor, pumps in the basement, and you close off first floor and you balance second and third, you made it easier to get water to second and third. Now you open first floor, what you, the valve positions you set on second and third 
aren't going to be right. All right, but per AABC, that's how you would balance a, a system with diversity. There's one sentence in there that makes it a caveat. So, um, that, that, yeah. Yeah, so, it would, I mean, yeah, I would, that's how we would do it per ABC. But you're saying. The, the new standard has one sentence in there that makes it a caveat in that okay. scenario that. Uh, it you, almost sounds like anything goes, you know, you, with the way you're explaining how to approach this. You know, whatever you think it would be the best in the given situ you know, scenario. That you to, a, to a point, Don, that's, that you're, you're correct, to a point, because that's the hard part is how are you going to do it? You know, if you close the floor off, you've just set up a system in a one-time scenario that is not going to ever be repeated. When is that first floor never going to have water? And then you balance second and third. So what's worse? You know, it's the old necessary evil conversation. And that's where you've got to sit down with the professional, design professional, go through it with even the owner and say, here's what we're looking at for your building. More the design professional say, how would you anticipate this building operating at a block load? And where can we look and say, what can we close off and how do you want to do it? So, but yeah, the, the new standards, there's one sentence in there that makes it vague, but not vague to the point that you still, you interpret it as we need to close off, so. Any other questions, comments? Magical answers of really how to do it? Right. Yep. Yep. Get everybody on the same page going in. Yeah. Yeah. So it goes into specifications. But on the other hand, you you have more insight. The balance of that has more insight than when the equipment came in. Right. Uh, this type of uh, Once you have the submittals, you're correct. That type of thing, it does right. have some concrete percentage that goes yeah. into the plan. Yeah. And usually there's enough time by the time you got submittals that you've got time to work on that plan and work with the design professional. Thank you. Anything else? Up. Depend depends how it's if you have two pumps, depends how your pipe sized and that scenario and how much diversity you have. If your pipe is sized as a common header that's only sized for 300 GPM. Right. Well, that's just, that's just a diagram. So typically you have two pumps. Typically, it's repeat, yeah, right? 300, 300. Why would you not set two pumps if you need to Because your two pumps, that common header pipe is sized for 300 GPM, not 600. Unless it's designed for parallel operation. And if it's designed for parallel operation, then you're, we, we'll walk to a job site and we'll look, the first thing we'll look at is that common header pipe size and say, is that the same pipe size as what my intake is? If it is, we know we have a repeat pump. 
we, in, our area, what we, in our area, what we typically see, if you have two pumps and they're size, they're, they're size for peat repeat, okay? That common header is size for the 300, 300, not for 600. And it's not size for... So... It's, it's standard diversity. So they don't, their connected load is determined, they, they don't ever calculate it. They, they very seldom add it up. The connected load is an individual room load. Right. You add that and that becomes, your block load is much less required to heat that building. That's the 300. Maidens are not sized for that full load. But that, okay. What do you got, Lincoln? Hey, Jim, yeah. Um, regarding the, the specification for how to do the balancing and having that from the design team, I mean, you and I have worked together from experience. It's, yeah, it's a lot of times it's met with, you know, good question. You guys, what did you do last time? How do you do that? Right. And, and my, my, as far as my question is, what, what would the approach look like or what would you think about the approach of the specification calling for a monitoring period or an endurance test and something for the test and balance contractor not to get in at the end of the project, do their balancing, get a report and get out, but to specify a monitoring period of two full seasons or something like that so we can do kind of what you talked about, use common sense, set it up, see if it works and if Trend it does, it. then document it. Would that be something that would be biddable? Yeah, I think because so, you can do it in one year. Make sure you have your season covered, and typically you got your season covered in your uh, seasonal statement that that y'all have already. So as long as you get that through that season, and hopefully that season's typical. Uh, I think it would be hard to write a prescriptive approach if the ABC yes. doesn't have one. I don't know how I'm going to come up right. with one. Right. Right. You know. No, I agree. Thank you. Slash. So thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Appreciate the comments.